بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ان آر لاسٹ لیکچر وی ہیڈ اے لک ایٹ دا لٹری اسٹائلسٹکس ہاؤ اٹ لکس ایٹ ویریس ایلیمنٹس لائک سمبلس امیجری میٹافرس پرسونیفیکیشنس وچ ہیلپ اس ان انڈرسٹینڈنگ دا میننگ آف دا ٹیکسٹ وچ دی رائٹرس ہیو ڈیلیبریٹلی کنویڈ ٹو اس تھرو میٹافورک اور سمبولک جیسچرس ناؤ ان دیز ٹیکسٹس وچ آر لٹری ٹیکسٹس There are particular functions that the language of literary writings perform. The function of the uh, stylistician is to identify, classify, and then comment upon these elements, which are adding to the meaning of the text. And when we uh, claim that we are learning uh, the features or the methods that stylistics uh, uses for the literary analysis of texts, we must understand that uh, how the literary language is different from ordinary language. In our understanding of the literary language, its differences and uh, its value, we try to look at what are the basic features that uh, dominate in a literary writing and uh, especially poetry. The analysis of poetry is what most of the formalists and even literary critics and now also stylisticians focus on. Because the language of uh, poetry offers more broader a scope for a critic to observe the work, form the judgments, and then uh, interpret how the style of language aids in conveying the meanings and how is it uh, related to the functions that uh, the, the various elements in the text perform. In today's lecture, we look at uh, how the language of poetry distinguishes itself from the ordinary language. What are the features that are uh, used Uh, by a writer to compose a poem so that he can convey the feeling of reality, dream, or a sensation of uh, any uh, thing that he has observed. Now, in order to make the writing appear authentic, true, and uh, realistic, there are many elements that uh, the writers focus on, and these elements work as a major uh, component of the uh, literary writing, that is the writing of poetry. Today we will have a look at uh, certain literary concepts uh, that uh, dominate in stylistics or that are relevant for a stylistician to observe in the analysis of poems and literary texts. These features are the obvious ingredients of any writing and today we will look at uh, these ingredients with specific reference to poetry. As in the previous two lectures, we have looked at uh, the literary stylistics, differentiating it from the linguistic stylistics. That literary stylistics fo focuses on the literary features. These literary features are the four grounded realities. And uh, these literary features are the deviations or the uh, disruption of the normal pattern of speech and writing. The first of such features which the literary stylisticians uh, focus on and the stylistics uh, takes into account as its uh, mode uh, or method is to pick up those individual curiosities or the ind individual foregrounded features within the text. And one of such features is a symbol. A symbol is an object which uh, stands uh, for something that is uh, something that exists outside the text. A symbol stands for something else. It may be something which may be a reference to something that exists in the political, moral, or religious terms. For example, we see that uh, the dove is a symbol of peace, and uh, white color is the symbol of purity. Snake is the symbol of uh, deceit. Now, these uh, images and uh, things stand for something larger or something broader than what they literally are. For example, a simple bird, dove, may not be recognized as a, just a species of uh, the bird. Rather, in literary writings, a symbol of dove may be employed to refer to the innocence and uh, the uh, simplicity which the bird symbolizes. It may even refer to peace. Uh, that is uh, the usual way we look at the image of a bird. In a poem or a story, uh, it is a word which uh, while signifying something specific may also signify uh, something that exists beyond itself. 
so symbols are those um, technical features in a literary writing or uh, more specifically in a poem that function to make us look at a thing in more broader perspective a writer may use the symbol of uh, maybe a caged bird now a caged bird symbolizes imprisonment that might be a reference which the writer wants the reader to reach at uh, in a very implicit way in order to reveal the political subjugation of the people of a country or uh, the uh, sort of uh, oppression that is the denial of the rights or even uh, freedom of speech so a caged bird in this uh, case would become a symbol of imprisonment injustice and tyranny that is uh, suppressed uh, life of a victim or an uh, individual who deserves uh, liberty or freedom so this is how the symbols would mean something uh, else in a poem the writer might be talking about a caged bird that does not sing now because it is away from uh, the uh, beauty of the forest or away from the rest of the birds it's it cannot see the light it cannot see the spring now this reference might not be literally to the bird who is caged because here the caged bird would symbolize something more greater and serious uh, than what the what the uh, bird in itself connotes now the symbolic meanings of the caged bird makes us uh, relate this symbol to uh, freedom which is the right of every individual it might be the idea of the uh, oppression and tyranny and injustice inflicted upon the common people or the people of a particular country uh, from whose uh, side the poet seems to be speaking so that is how the symbols operate within uh, a writing or a poem now it is important to understand what's the difference between image and symbol because mostly students uh, begin to take uh, the idea of uh, symbol and image uh, as, uh, in a, a way that uh, they mean uh, the same an image is associated with uh, what might be stated within the poem so what an image is associated with is usually found within the poem for example we look at uh, the image of uh, the um, for example uh, scattered uh, things or uh, the rotten things maybe the imagery of decay now these images are what reveal the chaos that exists in the life of the characters if the characters inhabit a world or a place where you observe that everything is in disorder clutter chaos or rotten things are abounding in the surroundings these images of clutter chaos and disintegration uh, reveal that the life of the characters within the story or a poem are uh, disorganized or are in a state of chaos that chaos might be there in the personal lives in their morals or even in their social or political scene as well now what the image uh, here refers to lies within the text whereas symbol might refer to something else J the way we looked at the caged bird that it within the poem the poet is implicitly and in a hidden manner uh, revealing to us that how the freedom of speech is denied now in that way the 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 symbol exists uh, outside the text whereas the image is within the text and uh, with the symbols or the use of uh, symbols by the writers we have to interf uh, we have to infer or interpret the meaning of uh, those associations which the writer has made for example observe uh, the same symbol of a caged bird that the inferences we draw out of the caged bird are that uh, the caged bird might be the poet himself if he is talking uh, with a viewpoint or a stance that might be labeled as a, a propaganda or that might be mm, uh, curtailed or uh, curbed as a desire of the poet because he is uh, creating uh, the uh, opposition for uh, the government or the people whom he is speaking against so in this way the symbol uh, makes associations and it is uh, up to the reader or it is up to the stylistician or the analyst to infer the meanings and draw the associations that the symbols draw for uh, the sake of uh, exam uh, for the sake of uh, multiplying and adding to the meaning of uh, the poem as we now understand the difference between image and symbol that images uh, are the objects uh, which are there in the poem 
whereas symbols are the objects which the writer wants to hint at. Uh, for example, observe uh, the uh, symbol of uh, the uh, dome-shaped whited uh, sepulchre in the uh, novel by Conrad, Heart of Darkness. In the Heart of Darkness, Joseph Conrad has employed uh, the symbol of uh, a place that is the office of uh, the imperialist missionary that operates in Africa. Now the symbol of the whited sepulcher or the dome shaped building uh, stands for something that exists outside the text as well on moral and religious grounds as well. For example the, the uh, sepulcher or the dome shaped building symbolizes the uh, place where the Jews bury the dead. Now it begins to give uh, this symbol gives the reference to the dead bodies or the grave. Now the office symbolizes the graves of those materialistic people who are pursuing their desires, lust and greed in Africa for the sake of collecting ivory or wealth. So this is how a symbol would operate that it would mean something else outside the text, outside the immediate situation of the poem or a writing. For example, uh, a poet uh, compares his uh, or her love uh, with a rose. For example, if a poet says that uh, his love is a red, red rose, here the poet is using a figurative image and is associating the lover with something uh, that is different uh, from uh, uh, something that uh, the person belongs to. So he is uh, taking something from a different realm of experience. The lover is not uh, a plant or not a vegetation the way the symbol uh, says that uh, it is a rose but here this particular uh, image of rose connotes the fact that uh, the lover is uh, beautiful that it reveals the red rose reveals the passion and the intensity of love and emotions which make uh, the poet see the lover in this light so this image of a rose brings to our mind the associations that love or the lover would have with the rose. Its beauty as the red rose is the most beautiful a flower, intense in color and also it has got fragrance. And when we look at the negative connotations too, we also find out that a rose, its life is uh, quite uh, transient, temporary, it may not, not last forever. It may not uh, be, uh, you know, as fresh as it is today, uh, forever. And also, uh, the fragrance may also fade away. It may wither out. And the rose also contains uh, thorns with it. Now, these associations make us understand why the writer has employed the image of rose for reference to the lover. So, if the images of a rose, we bring the association of the positive traits, associated with the rose and the negative uh, traits associated with the rose. Among the positive traits we can notice the uh, fragrance, the red color, the beauty and its appreciation but in the ne negative connotations we observe how the same rose has got uh, certain qualities which make it uh, difficult for uh, us to have it for example the thorns and then its uh, temporary life as would be a reference to the fact that uh, the poet is scared that uh, love is something that he would have to pay the price of before uh, getting it and also that uh, the love would be uh, not everlasting. He is scared of the fact that uh, the love may also fade away like the fragrance and beauty of the red rose. And red rose is a cherished possession. Everyone would be after the red rose. So. In this uh, way, looking at these associations which the images in a poem uh, make, we are able to see how much depth of meaning is carried within the images. Same is the case with symbols. If images draw our attention to the meanings that lie within uh, the understanding of uh, an image, it might be due to the associations and interpretations that we draw out of an image. Symbols are usually uh, used when a writer wants to express something uh, about uh, that is maybe apprehension or his uh, concern. It may be something that he cannot directly uh, refer to due to certain uh, restrictions, either political, moral or religious. So that is why symbols uh, work 
to uh, create a feeling that the writer has implicitly uh, hinted at those ideas which the society uh, may not let them speak about openly. It might, uh, you know, uh, bring about kind of uh, criticism from the authorities or maybe the society and the people, either political uh, uh, circles or religious circles. So that is why uh, a poet would use symbols. Then a direct uh, description wouldn't sound poetic enough. It would sound more like a description that is usually given for the sake of communication. So when poetry is composed, the writers do not want to reveal what they are talking about, who they are talking about, and why is it so. A writer's fall may be uh, in terms of his uh, fall of uh, maybe uh, not being successful in his career as a poet would not be referred to as directly that he failed to make a name in the circles of poetry. That fall might be denoted with a kind of uh, maybe uh, uh, sort of uh, description that uh, his uh, feelings or his uh, works or are going unrewarded. Now this image of uh, somebody not getting a reward of something uh, from maybe a friend or uh, a lover or uh, maybe a sibling might be a reference to the fact that the world is not rewarding the poet of uh, the contribution that he has made. So these are the ways a writer would express uh, the ideas. Similarly, the idea of uh, the cold-heartedness of the world might be referred to through the chill uh, in the weather or the things and surroundings uh, getting covered in snow. Now the image of snow presents the harsh or uh, the difficult circumstances in weather, but that might symbolically uh, reveal the difficulties uh, in the financial or the uh, personal life of a poet that would be his career maybe so in this way you can see that how uh, a symbol or an image would enable the poet to comment on those things which are uh, so so personal to them and when they uh, present them through symbols or images these personal things become a bit uh, you know covered up and then it is uh, not uh, possible for the reader to decipher the very meaning. Rather, the associations that the readers draw are quite enough to supply the meanings and reveal the very nature of the sentiment that the poet has expressed. As far as the use of symbols is concerned, we find in poetry that uh, poets uh, start with an object and then uh, the object that has been taken from the real world will be loaded with meaning that would be a symbolic meaning which is not expi explicitly stated. Imagine uh, Keats's Ode to a Nightingale. In Ode to a Nightingale he has presented the nightingale as uh, a kind of symbol of eternity, beauty, joy, splendor and a heavenly state of life. The Nightingale in Keats's Ode has been there in the ancient times and is able to sing now as well and would be singing when the poet would, no, would be no more. Now this idea that uh, the symbolic significance of Keats's Nightingale has increased with the fact that uh, the bird has been free to sing in the ancient times and also would be free to sing even when the poet would be no more reveals the very fact that it is a symbol of eternity. So how a simple object, a bird, has been invested with meaning, that is the symbolic meaning. So you can see that uh, Keats's nightingale becomes the symbol of eternity and uh, it is something that he sees uh, in uh, the bird's song and feels in the bird's movement and freedom that he invests it with tantalizing significance. Now this significance is beyond the bird. If you observe the bird without looking at it symbolically, you would not believe the bird to be that significant because the bird like a human being too is temporal and is mortal. But when Keats states that the bird speaks something that comes from the heaven or is an eternal voice that has been heard in the past and that will be heard in the future but the poet cannot really be uh, eternal or enter into the realm 
or paradise where the bird has entered. Now, these symbolic associations that we make with the bird make the bird a symbol that stands for something else than its literal existence. Now, symbols become an aid in understanding the meaning of the poem because a writer invests a symbol with plenty of meaning and with multiple meanings which the readers draw on the basis of the evidence and they make inferences out of the text and the work. One thing that is uh, a tricky part of the use of symbols in the uh, poems or literary writing is that uh, symbolism can lose uh, touch with the reality. When a poem becomes symbolic it might lose a touch with reality just the way it happens in the example that we studied that Keats's poem Ode to a Nightingale would not give meaning or would not be effective for its interpretation if the bird is took in a literal meaning the presence or the existence that has been granted to the image of a bird but when the image of a bird is looked at symbolically only then we find out the meanings of escapism of the transience of life and of the yearning and longing for uh, a beautiful life like that of uh, paradise so in this way we can see that uh, if symbols are uh, difficult and tricky to interpret uh, at the same time they also uh, make the poem enter into uh, the unrealistic or more fantastic a world where uh, these operate for the sake of uh, enhancing uh, the impact of the poem as well as the impact of the image. For the sake of understanding of symbolism observe another example that is from William Blake's uh, poem. In this poem Blake uh, makes use of the symbol of a red rose now look how strange unusual the use of red rose is O rose thou art sick the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy and his dark secret love does thy life destroy this example by William Blake tells us that rose stands for something else then the very flower because he's addressing the rose calling that rose is getting sick and some invisible insect is destroying its beauty is uh, quietly eating it up and it's uh, being destroyed now if you look at the poem literally you would feel that uh, the poet is talking about uh, something that relates to the idea of uh, the uh, gardener's life that he would be concerned with the fact that how the plant or the rose is decaying that some worm is uh, eating it now that does not really justify the purpose that a poet would compose a poem the poet is not conveying these things to uh, a gardener who should be taking care of the rose because it is being eaten up by a worm here the rose symbolizes something else something that does not exist within the poem but there in the imagination of the poet to which the reader and the analyst has to reach to here the the rose becomes the symbol of the beloved who the poet feels is being destroyed by an enemy or a foe so the poem gives the image of something evil destroying something beautiful now the beautiful thing is the rose that stands for the beloved and the evil thing is the worm that stands for the enemy or the foe and looking at it metaphorically as uh, is its interpretation is concerned we find that uh, it talks about the corruption or the corrupt passion that is destroying the beauty and innocence of the relationship of love so in this way see how uh, a symbol stands for something that is larger uh, than uh, the image itself that lies outside the very context of the poem and that uh, makes us understand that how poetry enhances our understanding that things may not be meaningful only if they are taken in their literal meanings so if we go beyond the literal meaning of uh, these uh, words and uh, understand the interpretation of the symbolic 
meanings of the poem and the image of the rose only then we understand what the poet is talking about something that he cannot directly talk about and if he can talk about it directly still we find that it won't be a literary expression now it becomes literary expression when it has become very ambiguous uh, that how artfully the poet has uh, camouflaged the uh, presence of the lover or his own feelings and then with the uh, symbol of a rose he has described how the uh, rose being destroyed by the worm is the symbol of his love or his beloved being destroyed or ruined or corrupted by some enemy or a foe so this is how the symbols operate in work and this is the job of a stylistician to observe that uh, what symbols have been employed what do they mean literally what do they connote what do they refer to so in terms of its interpretation we re we rely on the uh, interpretation of symbols for the sake of the fact that they enhance our understanding of the poems and they develop our appreciation about the poems as well apart from symbols and images which uh, the poets use in works like uh, composition of the poems which pack the poems with plenty of meaning and make it uh, difficult for the reader to guess what the things they are talking about because the reference is not direct but an indirect reference which needs to be inferred through the understanding of the connotations there are other elements too that are literary elements employed by the poets in their poems which create the poetry as a form or a work that operates differently than prose or ordinary speech and writing uh, another important feature that we observe in poetry while we analyze it from the point of view of a stylistician or a literary stylistician is called rhythm rhythm is a very important ingredient in poetry because uh, you observe that when we listen to songs and poems we remember them for a longer time as compared to reading lines or quotations from prose we may remember the gist or the summary of a novel or a story but hardly do we remember the lines until or unless we memorize them but poetry without much effort becomes very uh, easy to be remembered and one of the reasons of uh, the memorability is that it carries rhythm and rhythm is created with the use of words which are balanced which rhyme due to their uh, maybe alliterative pattern or consonants and assonance rhythm means the flow and the movement of lines and in poetry the writers deliberately take pains and plenty of care to create rhythm in the poem whether it goes fast or slow or it could be calm or troubled too so rhythm of a poem may appear like maybe something that is uh, smooth that is like uh, you know very uh, flowing just the way it is in lyrics and songs that they appear smooth lyrical and have a certain flow because of the words which might uh, correspond in the form of rhyme similarly the rhythm can also be uh, something that might break appear disjointed like a sort of staccato beat which is uh, more like uh, jumps or uh, it is uh, disjointed too so the rhythm can be of these two extremes either it might be too uh, flowy rhythmic and uh, calm or it may be troubled or show breaks in the utterances or in the rhythm rhythm and meaning cannot be separated so it is important to understand that rhythm is not the surface beauty of a poem it's not something that operates at the level of the structure or the surface of the poem it it's not a device which is only employed for the sake of making the poem or a song or a lyric memorable rather for a stylistician this point is very important that rhythm and meaning cannot be separated you can observe many instances of poems and songs where you feel that uh, there is a correspondence between the rhythm of the poem and the meaning of the poem observe the example of the modern poetry in general modern poetry is uh, that is the poetry after the 20th century 
and of the Second World War, like the poetry of uh, Eliot, Ezra Pond, or uh, W. B. Yeats, or uh, poets like uh, Philip Larkin, and uh, also uh, the modern poets uh, in the form of E. E. Cummings. These poets' poems um, appear uh, to be uh, taking, uh, making a sort of experiment with the rhythm of the poems. Why? Because the themes of these poems have become quite serious and they relate to the chaos, disintegration and uh, the idea of uh, peace being disturbed in the world. So if the poetry composed by the poets after the Second World War uh, is about the themes of uh, destruction, themes of man losing control on his uh, life that is due to his uh, preoccupation with the uh, destroying things that lie there in the form of opposition or uh, the idea that uh, the morals uh, of the world have gone array. It is aided with the disjointed rhythm in the poem. Observe Eliot's poems that uh, also make use of uh, the aid or for the um, breaking of the rhythm which relates to the fact that the lack of rhythm in the poem reveals the fact that there uh, is something lacking in the modern man's life. The rhythm is disturbed so the protagonist or the persona's life is what it corresponds with which is lacking in action, which is lacking in harmony and who is suffering with inertia or it's con it's, if it, uh, who is suffering with sort of uh, inertia and is also uh, revealing the picture of uh, the uh, disjointed, disorganized uh, human being. So in this way we see that uh, rhythm and meaning correspond. If a poet is making use of flow and rhyme and rhythm in the poem, he wants to convey a sense of order, symmetry and if he is making use of uh, the rhythm that is disjointed and disturbed, he is trying to convey the sense of something is wrong in the state of affairs of uh, the life of the persons that he is talking about. So observe this example. Thus I, faltering forward, leaves around me falling, wind oozing thin through the thorn for norward and the woman calling. In this example that is from uh, Thomas Hardy's poem, you can see that uh, there is alliteration of the word f uh, on the words faltering, forward, falling and uh, there is a certain uh, break thus I faltering forward leaves around me falling wind oozing thin through the thorn now thin through the thorn for onward and the woman calling so the images like uh, cold or uh, images like the wind and also leaves falling and uh, wind oozing in the form of uh, the chill of the winter that is penetrating through the body of uh, the persona. Now all these things in the rhythm that are uh, created to aid to the idea of uh, cold and chill and isolation, loneliness and also the mood of despair. So this is how rhythm in a poem also uh, relates to the mood, the feeling uh, the poet wants to convey to the reader because he can do that only through the use of uh, suitable words. And here the suitable words create uh, a feeling of or sensation of cold and isolated man and that he has found himself in despair as if he has been abandoned, as if he is lonely and the chill uh, and cold is not due to the winds only or the harsh weather but it is due to loneliness and despair. So that mood of the poem corresponds with the rhythm that is faltering and falling. The, these words and uh, sounds convey the same sense as if the poet is falling apart or the persona is breaking due to the chill, due to the cold, despair and uh, being abandoned uh, and leading a solitary life. So this is how these images within the poem uh, correspond with the rhythm and add to the meaning of the poem. So in this way the poets employ rhythm in the poem to correspond it and to aid uh, the meaning and the theme of the poem. 
observe another example for example the last example that we looked at was from the point of view of despair loneliness abandonment this example would give another idea about uh, the the rhythm uh, in john dunn's poem the sun rising he states busy old fool unruly sun why does through thus through windows and through curtains call on us now in this example you see that dunn is directly addressing the sun and is a bit angry and even uh, sort of uh, you can say uh, maybe it's revealing the frustration too for the sun's intervention into his life because he wants to sleep he doesn't want to wake up so the f the sun has been referred to as busy his regularity is condemned now instead of praising the sun for rising regularly unlike the poet he is condemning it and calling it busy rather than disciplined and then calling it a fool because he doesn't uh, operate on his own whims and wishes and follows a routine and in this way you can see that uh, the way he calls it busy old fool unruly son the word unruly fool busy and then the questioning uh, tone and technique why through windows and through curtains call on us it's colloquial it's uh, ordinary language it's not the language that is quite formal so in the colloquial uh, form you see that the rhythm is chatty it's like conversation and uh, the anger the frustration uh, is also evident so it's lively questioning manner or interrogative manner employed by the poet in order to sound a bit uh, informal so the informal way is aided by the rhythm of the poem that is uh, adding to the theme of the poem that the poet is showing uh, that he does not want to follow rules if sun is something that obeys the rules and regulates the whole world through its uh, comings and goings the poet is least bothered about it so in this chatty colloquial and conversational interrogative manner the rhythm of the poem uh, aids to the theme or the feeling of the poem that is the poet is uh, not uh, bound within the conventions of the society or the universe when it comes to uh, the feeling of love or uh, doing what he desires in life so the rhythm in the poem is corresponding with the theme and the image that the poet wants to convey to the reader closely connected with the rhythm is rhyme as a rhythm might be something that you find in every word every sound in the poem and the overall composition of the poem whereas rhyme is usually identified with either the end rhyme or the internal rhyme then there are many types of uh, the rhyme as well so rhyme is the identity of sounds how sounds uh, seem similar within a poem or within a line if uh, certain uh, words have got the same sound for example the use of alliteration the furrow followed free the fair breeze blew the white foam flew now in this example see that the furrow followed free in these uh, words you can notice the uh, repetition of the fur sound furrow followed free this is rhyme that is created through the uh, use of uh, alliteration the internal rhyme now the end rhyme is the fair breeze blew the white foam flew now blew and flew in the end are rhyming together so this is the end rhyme so rhyme suggests harmony order balance and it is usually employed either at the end of the word or in the uh, in uh, running uh, lines which might be the internal rhyme as well so the poet finds connections between words if uh, only at the level of sound but the connection made uh, suggests something broader the idea may be finding order in things finding order in life or conveying the sense of calmness or uh, the organization the idea of flow similarity beauty these are the ways the poets would employ rhyme not only to add to memorability but also to convey a sense of order peace and uh, calmness 
within the poem or within the context of the poem. For the sake of observing uh, the rhyme and rhythm, that concept of rhyme and rhythm that is the most significant one as far as uh, the conventional and romantic poetry or classical poetry is concerned. Though in the modern poems we see there are violations uh, about rhyme and rhythm as well. But if they break the rhyme and rhythm in terms of uh, uh, the end rhyme, the poets in the modern times use internal rhyme uh, still in their poems. Observe this example that is by Wordsworth, uh, the poem is Solitary Reaper. Observe that uh, the writer has made use of certain words which rhyme together. Not only uh, they create internal rhyme, but add to the rhythm uh, that is the overall pattern of the poem. Behold her single in the field, yon solitary highland lass, reaping and singing by herself, stop here or gently pass. Alone she cuts and binds the grain, and sings a melancholy strain. O oh, listen for the wail profound is overflowing with the sound. In other words, Laz and pass, grain and strain, profound and sound are rhyming together. Now this end rhyme on las, pass, grain, strain, profound, sound adds the rhythm. And as the poet in the poem is saying that the song of uh, the girl is rhythmic, it's beautiful. He doesn't narrate the song that what the girl in the uh, fields is singing, but their harmony the flow that the feeling of listening to a song evokes in a reader's mind or in the poet's mind is captured by the use of rhyme and rhyme in the poem. So the same flow that the song has got, the same flow that uh, the uh, poet has tried to capture through words is done by uh, the poet in the form of uh, the rhythm and rhyme that he creates within the poem. So the flow of the song, that is the theme of the poem, because in the poem, the poet is praising the beauty, the harmony of the song. How pure, how natural, and how uh, unrestrained unrestra the expression of the girl was. Now the girl who was singing in the field is not seen by us. Neither the song of uh, the girl which she was singing when the poet encountered her is described. What is described is that the song was rhythmic. She was singing gently. She was busy in work as well as in singing. And she was singing a melancholy song. And the whole valley was overflowing or was filled with the beautiful song of the girl. And in order to relate to what a rhythmic and beautiful and melancholy song it would be, the writer has made use of uh, the rhyme in the form of the end rhyme. Then certain words like uh, sings and strain create internal rhyme. In the third last line you can see that the word sings and strain, they rhyme together, that is internal rhyme. Then look at uh, these words like uh, highland las. Now Highland Laz also has a, uh, s a kind of flow. It does not uh, s get stuck when we speak it. And uh, look at uh, the uh, expressions like uh, use of uh, the ing form. Singing, reaping. Now the word singing, reaping, and then in the last line, the word overflowing. The ing form makes uh, the idea more continuous more like uh, going something going on, activity is going on right now as well. And it is uh, adding to the fact that uh, the writer or the poet feels that since the memory is alive, the action is also going on, still going on in his mind. So the ing form or the gerund form adds to the continuity and the flow, which is aided with the end rhyme as well, internal rhyme as well, and the use of the ing form or the present continuous tense on various occasions in this stanza. So this is how if we observe minutely we would find rhythm and rhyme operating to perform various functions in a poem. So now it is clear that rhythm and rhyme is not just the external beauty of a poem that is done for the sake of making the poem memorable or making the words balance so that they can be remembered and they are not forgotten. 
Look how uh, through our observation of these examples has made us understand that rhyme too has something to do with the meanings of the poems. If the rhyme is breaking, it is stuttering, it is uh, coming across hurdles and blockages, it reveals the disjointed and disintegrated life of the characters, the feelings of or the thoughts of uh, the persona. If it is flowing like the way it is in the solitary reaper, it reveals how much peace, how much calmness does the poet derive from uh, the moment of experience that he is describing to the reader. The beauty, the flow, the continuity of the memory and uh, the remembrance has brought the same at the level of the structure of the poem. And that structural device of rhythm and rhyme is connected to the theme, the meaning of the poem, the message of the poem. Similarly, observe the idea of rhyme that is closely connected to the rhythm. We can say that uh, rhyme is linked uh, as it can be something that can link the problematic words as well. Now, rhyme cannot be only uh, looked at uh, one way that we looked earlier at, that rhyme is making certain similar things correspond. Rhyme can also bring closer to desperate things, to opposite things. For example, Observe how rhyme can bring antithetical, unusual, and desperate uh, opposites together. That is the example from uh, Andrew Marvel. Uh, that is, uh, he is a metaphysical poet, and the poem uh, that I have chosen to take the example from is his coy mistress. In his coy mistress, Marvel states that uh, had we but world enough in time, his uh, this coy this coyness lady were no crime. Now observe this uh, couplet that uh, in this uh, line he has used the word time and then it is rhyming with the uh, second line's last word crime. Observe the meaning of these two words time and crime. They reveal a sort of a problematic state that uh, they are troublesome ideas but here they are absorbed into a couplet and uh, rhyme has this ability to unify, to connect or bring closer to disparate or opposite entities like time and crime. Finding similarity in dissimilarities is what is the job of uh, the uh, stylistician. We see that the problem of uh, time and crime highlighted by the poet deserves significance. Though they are rhyming together as time and crime sound the same uh, because of the end rhyme but they do not really mean uh, the same as far as their meaning is concerned. How we see that the use of rhyme contributes to the overall meaning and effect of the poem? That is, uh, crime is something that is uh, negative. Time is something that is uh, the present, the age, the world. Now, crime doesn't correspond with time in terms of meaning but only in terms of structure as far as the rhyme is concerned. So if he's saying to the beloved in the poem that uh, the time is running out, the world would fade away as they would be dead soon, then the coyness or shyness would be a crime. So if uh, the lady or uh, the beloved is not willing to submit to the wishes of uh, the uh, lover, then the time that is uh, the world that is at their disposal wouldn't be enough for them because uh, he's persuading her that it's a crime not to give way to the feelings and emotions which uh, the be beloved wants her to express. So in this way, time reflects life. Time reflects uh, what uh, is at hand. Time reflects the age. And crime reveals something negative that is a violation, that may be uh, something that is punishable. But how the poet has uh, brought these two opposites together in order to convince uh, us for the argument or the persona in the poem is convincing the beloved and making the ar an argument, that argument becomes more appalling and uh, significant when the two opposites are linked through the use of rhyme. So see how rhyme may not be only bringing two similar things together, the way it was there in the last poem, singing and reaping. Now those uh, things were again looked at from the perspective one is activity that is of uh, kind of a laborious activity and the other is an activity that is of recreation. 
So singing becomes recreational and uh, reaping uh, as cutting the grain symbolizes it is, is something that becomes uh, work or uh, that becomes a physical uh, labor. So this is how rhyme in, uh, and rhythm are both connected to the meanings and uh, how uh, minutely we as uh, the learners and students of stylistics are supposed to observe the rhyme, the rhythm, pattern and the structure of the poem. Another important feature that we must take into account when we uh, look at a poem from the point of view of a stylistician or uh, from the literary point of view is the uh, issue of uh, locating the speaker or the persona and the audience of a poem. So when you come across a poem, one thing that you ask yourself is that who is speaking in the poem? Who is addressing us? Or who is it that he is addressing to? Now these are the problems that you might also be coming across in the novels and the stories too because in the novels and stories it is pretty easier to locate the characters and who are those that they are talking to or addressing to. But in a poem it becomes difficult because poems are a bit ambiguous, they are a bit uh, short as well in length so they do not allow the writer a room to develop a character within the poem. So a poem is usually associated with the poet as it is the expression of the poet's feeling so we say that the poet is saying so. But a number of times in poems it might not be the poet who directly locates himself within the poem. The poet might create a character that is called a persona He's, who speaks on behalf of the poet. That is the imaginary character that the poet might have created for the sake of conveying uh, the sense or the meaning in the poem. So unlike a story or a novel, the problem of locating the persona or even the audience in the poem becomes a bit troublesome for the reader and usually for uh, the uh, uh, literary stylisticians and uh, the readers too. So look at these examples. These examples would help you understand what uh, is the difference between uh, the speaker and the persona and the poet. Firstly, look at uh, the fact that the poem might be written from the perspective of the poet himself. Within the poem, the poet might be directly addressing the audience, that is the reader. Now audience can be the reader, that is something that exists outside the text. But within the poem there might be some other audience too, maybe poet addressing to uh, a friend, a poet addressing to a particular society or a group of people, poet addressing within the poem to a beloved maybe. So the audience within the poem in the immediate context might be a specific person and then the implied audience that uh, exists outside the text is the reader. This example states that a poet might be talking himself directly through the poem as is the case with maybe a poem like an ode. This is the example from Milton's uh, ode on his blindness where he states that when I consider how my light is spent are half my days in this dark world and wide lodged with me useless though my soul more bent. Now the words I consider how my light is spent my days and um, lodged me useless my soul more bent they reveal that the poet as it is an ode is talking directly. So where here we say that it is the poet's direct expression, his uh, thoughts express, expressed directly to the reader and the audience is uh, the reader directly. So such a poem is simple to understand. In such a poem like this is an ode, it is simple to locate the persona or the poet. But in poems which are the for example dramatic monologues it becomes a bit difficult because uh, the persona might not be the poet himself. Though the poet is uh, the composer of the poem but within the poem he might have created some character that speaks uh, as differently 
or narrate some experience which might not have been the experience of the poet himself but an imaginary situation. So look at the dramatic monologue. An example is uh, My Last Touches by Robert Browning. In it we see that uh, it is not Browning, it is not persona uh, that is speaking rather. It is a character. It is uh, not the poet but an implied character. That is, that is my last duchess painted on the wall looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day and there she stands. Here we see that this utterance in the poem is uttered by a character that has been designed, created by the poet. So we do not say that Dutch, the uh, poet or Robert Browning is telling us about his last duchess. Here we say that Browning created a persona or a character within his dramatic monologue, My Last Duchess, in which this character is a duke or a king who is telling an implied listener who is uh, the ambassador of some other country about the last duchess that is now lying there in the form of a painting. It is the painting that is being observed. So look that difference. We observe the ode first that was Milton's On His Blindness where Milton directly is expressing his grief and his sorrow at the fact of losing the eyesight that how would he serve God now. That was the poet himself speaking within the poem. But here in this example of a dramatic monologue by Robert Browning, you clearly see that Browning has created a character who is a king or a duke and it's not the poet himself, it's not Browning himself and he is talking to an implied listener who is uh, the ambassador of another country about somebody that we do not meet in the poem but see only in the form of the portrait painted on the uh, canvas. That is the way uh, the poet to problematize the idea of speaker, persona and audience. Now the audience becomes the uh, immediate person whom uh, the Duke is addressing. In this poem, in the context of this poem, the Duke is the persona or the character speaking and the ambassador from another country is the implied listener. But outside the context of the poem, the reader is also the implied listener. So this is how uh, problematic this is, that uh, not just characters would exist on, only in the stories and uh, novels, characters are also found within the poem. That is why we need to locate the speaker, that who is talking, who is speaking within the poem or narrating the experiences or who the poem is addressed to, who the uh, persona or the speaker is talking to. So observe the last example by Dunn that was the poem uh, The Good Morrow, Busy Old Fool, Unruly Son, Why Does Thou Through Windows and Through Curtains Call on Us. There you can see that the persona was addressing the son. There the audience was uh, a kind of abstract thing that is son. So this is how you can locate the audience, the speaker, the persona uh, within a poem. And not always would the poem be kind of uh, utterance that is the expression of a poet who is directly talking to the reader. So mostly the uh, novics or uh, the laymen consider that uh, the poem is always uh, showing us the presence of a poet or the experience of a poet. Just the way a dramatist or uh, a novelist might not have gone through the experiences, all the experiences that he makes his characters go through. Similarly, a poet too might not have gone through the same experiences which he narrates in his poems through various characters or personas. They might be the thoughts, they might be the imagination, the reverie and the fantasy of the poet too. And then like in the dramatic monologues, there might be imaginative situations and characters which the poets create. So 
as a stylistician and as a literary stylistician or the student of stylistics, when you perform the literary analysis, give consideration to the thought of a speaker and the persona and locate the audience that might lie within the poem and the uh, persona that might be the poet himself or some character that is created by the poet. So, speaker, persona and audience are one of the major elements that you locate when you are observing the style of poetry, when you are analyzing the composition of poetry. So, it helps you in understanding the meanings of the poems and helps you understand that how the composition of a poem through the use of certain techniques like speaker, audience, persona makes the message appear more realistic, authentic and even uh, attractive to the reader. Another important element that uh, as the learners of stylistics and as the analysts of literature we are supposed to focus on is situation and setting. We are talking uh, within the context of a poem. We are talking about the interpretation and analysis of poetry. So poetry also or a poem also exhibits a setting. It also takes place in a particular situation. So it's not just the novels or plays or short stories where the setting or the situation is important. Situation is the place or the location within a poem. It is where the action takes place. For example, observe the last example that was uh, My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. There you can uh, talk about the situation in this way that the situation is uh, a point or a time in the persona or the Duke's life when he is meeting a messenger from another country and the place is the palace itself. Now the poem is taking place in a particular setting that is the palace of the Duke and he is showing the portraits of uh, his family to the messenger. Now the setting is the palace and the situation is that he has got a proposal by the messenger and the messenger has brought the proposal of uh, and maybe the duchess of their country or the princess of their country for the duke. That is why he is telling him about his history or past or showing off the uh, lineage or uh, the ancestors or the portraits of uh, the house. Now you can see that we located the situation. Situation is the immediate context within which a character is placed. For example, the duke in my last duchess is placed in a particular time when he is about to uh, choose another uh, wife that is uh, closer uh, in our understanding due to the fact that he has uh, been uh, invited by uh, the Duke as the imagery is paying him a visit and the location is the palace itself. Then it might be something imaginary too for example uh, imaginary setting can be uh, something abstract for example a poet imagining a moment of parting with a beloved or uh, maybe imagining uh, his uh, time of death or uh, imagining uh, his life beyond death. Observe Emily Dickinson's poems where she talks about uh, a fly buzz. She says uh, in the poem that I heard a fly buzz when I died. Now in that poem by Dickinson the setting is uh, the uh, implied setting or an abstract setting that is a deathbed or a grave. Now she hasn't experienced it yet or you know she is not revealing it after leaving the world rather she is revealing it in imagination. Now the setting is that of a deathbed or a grave that is sort of abstract an idea. The situation is not something that the persona might have experienced. So you can see that how setting can be real world that is the concrete setting like uh, the palace of a king, the countryside, a particular room in which an action takes place or it might be anything that is maybe uh, the uh, sort of uh, description of heaven or hell. So the imaginary setting might be the situation or a moment that is not concrete or physical setting but uh, that, that exists in the mind, that exists in the imagination and fantasy of a poet. So in this way, look how setting can be located 
within a poem. It is the immediate place, concrete place where action takes place. It is also imaginary setting where the writer or the poet is imagining the things or himself uh, to be uh, you know existing. Closely related to the ideas of uh, situation, setting and also uh, the tone and uh, the uh, rhythm of the poem are the ideas of mood and uh, the tone of the poem. Mood and tone are connected to the expressions, the words, the language that the poets have employed. The feeling that a poem conveys is conveyed uh, through the words and uh, those feelings might range from anything like uh, a mood that might be happy, sad, exasperated or uh, it might be dejected or uh, regretful too. Then uh, comes the tone which might be sarcastic, ironic, humorous, serious, melancholic. Now there would be use of particular words which would uh, imply or hint that the poem conveys uh, sarcastic, ironic, uh, humorous or exasperated feelings of uh, the poet or characters then the mood of the poem through the words can be judged or identified to be adding to the melancholy sadness gloom for the understanding of mood and tone we can say that the poem uh, is uh, optimistic the poem is pessimistic now these are the generalizations that you make on the basis of the evidence that you find in the text of the poem depending upon the words being used observe the example that is taken from the road not taken by Robert Frost Robert Frost's poem I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence two roads diverged in a wood and I I chose the one less traveled by now the words like sigh and then reference to the passage of time with the repetition of the word ages and ages then repetition of this phrase and I again the next slide begins with I took the one less traveled by it reveals that the poet is in a feeling of uh, maybe a pensive or a sad mood the word sigh uh, shows feeling of regret, loss or the f inability to go back to a point in life or time when he uh, could have made some other choice. So it is the words like sigh and repetition of the word ages and then repetition of the word I which reveals a sense of uh, sadness, a feeling of regret, a feeling of melancholy, a feeling of uh, dejection or uh, inability that is showing his incapacity as a human being not to be able to go back and change the things of the past. So this is how the words, the diction, the expressions convey the mood and make up the overall tone of the poem. The tone might be sarcastic or it might be humorous or it might be pessimistic or it might be optimistic it would range to multiple emotions and feelings of a human uh, being and that is possible only through the use of specific words words which are emotive words we discussed in the previous few lectures the significance of emotive language that how a language conveys the emotions of a speaker and how it makes the reader to relate with the same emotions. Here in this example by uh, Robert Frost taken from uh, The Road Not Taken, you can see that uh, the power of these emotive words, that emotive words are conveying a mood and making up overall tone of the poem. That is carrying the feeling of sadness, gloom and regret and uh, that is how the tone or the mood of a poem express the fact that a poet after all has composed this poem in order to present to the reader the idea that how words are useful and effective in conveying those feelings which might only be there in the mind or in the heart. Now those emotions which are quite difficult to express also find their way through the very organized use of emotive language and then its organization into a rhythmic 
or uh, a flowy verse and then through repetitions and emotive words it may convey uh, loss, regret or even pain, sorrow, dejection and even anger, frustration or uh, sort of uh, feeling of uh, uh, you can say um, jealousy or uh, maybe it can be connected to the idea of uh, satire and uh, sarcasm. So it's the emotive words and language, expressive words and language that conveys the tone and mood of a poem. Observe this example by Dylan Thomas. In this example, Dylan Thomas states that do not go gentle into that good night and also in the third line makes use of the word rage and rep repeats it rage rage against the dying of the light just the way we discussed earlier that a poem can also express anger it can also express a feeling of exasperation or uh, you can say frustration here that is evident that the poet says do not go gentle into that good night he's telling the reader or some implied listener not to accept death calmly fight against it then the use of word rage or anger is uh, tempting the reader or the implied persona to fight against death to fight against giving up so that example shows that uh, how different set of words diction and emotive language can change the mood of uh, the feeling of the poem in the previous example that was from road not taken the mood of dejection inability and uh, sadness dominated in this poem by Dylan Thomas the mood of anger frustration dominates which is exhibited by the particular words like warning do not go gentle into good night and then rage rage against the dying of the light so this is how the emotive words expressions accurately depict what the poet is feeling and he may create or arouse the same feeling in the reader when the reader reads it he undergoes the same experiences and as stylisticians it is uh, your job that uh, like a stylistician you're supposed to estimate locate such words and expressions which are creating a particular mood or which are creating a particular tone of the poem so in today's lecture we looked at a few very important stylistic and uh, figurative or uh, literary uh, notions and devices like symbol, image, tone, mood, speaker, situation, audience or persona. Now these features are what we looked at from the perspective of uh, the uh, analysis of poetry. So in the coming few lectures also we will uh, observe the ingredients of poems from the perspective of stylistician and also we will also look at how prose operates uh, using the same features and how are they different from uh, the features that are studied uh, for the sake of analysis of poetry. Thank you.